KB, baby. Here with KB. Hello, KB. <laughs> Hi, guys. New York City, and that's Crystal Ball. Currently walking to the podcast studio in New York City to do an episode of Breaking Points with Crystal Sager and Marshall. And uh, Hi. Crystal Hi. really has to pee at the moment. <laughs> I'm dying. I'm not sure, really if, dying. <laughs> not sure if she wanted me to divulge that information, but for basically the last 35 minutes of the ride, 45 minutes of the ride, she's been battling her bladder. So this is definitely gonna be the most challenging part of my day. <laughs> we are trying to take care of that need at the moment, but I think we're right by the studio, so we should be good soon. Probably a good sign that the COVID-19, probably a good sign that the COVID-19 testing place does not have a line, I would say. So we made it to the studio, um, random ass building in the middle of uh, downtown Manhattan. And I got in the elevator, dog, the elevator is so herky jerky. Like I thought there was a 17% chance I was gonna die. Like every time it stops at a floor, it just like, <clears throat> it was very like, it was a very clear like grind to a quick stop. Oh, it was scary. I was scared as fuck. And then, you know, looking for a bathroom, the door was locked. We asked the janitor to open it. Homeboy only spoke Vietnamese. It was a little bit crazy. It was a little bit crazy, but we're here at the studio now. Um, and hopefully I don't die on the elevator on the way out. But in terms of the actual studio itself, I'll show you guys in a second. It's a pretty good studio. It's a pretty good studio. It looks like very high quality. So I'll show you guys that. So this is the studio. Very sexy studio, if I don't say so myself. <laughs> Thank you. It really looks nice. Oh, it does? Yeah. I love that light once. Well, we can recognize that what happens in one feeder affects another feeder. So for example, um, this just happened yesterday, and then like reporting this is a little inconclusive, so I don't want to overstate, but, but the flagship of Russia's Black Sea fleet. Hey guys, we just recorded the show. Um, it was fun. Did you like it? Yeah, it was. Um, it was kind of cool talking about higher level, big policy topics, not yeah. necessarily like directly tied to one or the other news item. So they let their premium subscribers vote on what we're supposed to talk about and they picked all the most substantive topics. Yeah. <laughs> on the one hand, it's good because it shows they're intelligent and they want to learn about like high level stuff. But then on the other hand, they required homework now from you, for you and right. for me and for everybody. Right. And I'm not going to lie, I was in the mood to go in there and just like debate daylight savings time with soccer. Right. You know? Yeah. So, so we gave them a list of 15 things they could choose from. And they literally, like all the sort of political hot topic ones, they were like, nah, they got the yeah. lowest ratings. They were like, we wanna hear about housing policy, energy policy, geopolitical realignment, future of labor, I'm always happy to talk about that. Um, and one other that I'm forgetting. Uh, housing. Uh, you said geopolitical energy. realignment. Healthcare. Healthcare, healthcare. Yeah, yeah, that was one of, healthcare and housing were basically tied for number one and two, which kind of makes sense. It does make sense, yeah. So um, it, go check that out on their channel. By the time you're watching this, that's already been up for, a while so go check that out it was fun and now in a little bit we're gonna go visit with Kristen Small that's the right man himself. Amazon labor union president himself so we're gonna do that and meet with Marianne Williamson later Bye guys. one day what's up everybody I am sweating and eating at the same time I feel fat as hell mm -hmm. um, I just feel it's too damn hot, isn't it? Like, it's too hot in here. It's 80 degrees outside, but I'm wearing like a long sleeve shirt. I feel shitty. Anyway, um, here with Crystal. And here with the man of the hour, the lead organizer himself, Chris Smalls. What's up, everybody? How you doing? We're all eating, talking about unionizing the entire world. Um, so we're probably going to be assassinated within like 24 hours. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we love you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. They almost certainly treat those things like shit. So I wouldn't want one of them to pull me. Am I being too crystal? Am I being too? We're having a discussion about. Am I being too um, lefty, lefty or libby or too pita-ish? Peta-ish. <laughs> no, I think it's a very valid concern. 
then you have to balance that with, you know, the guys who, that's how they earn their living. Like, we need a just transition if we're going to move away from this, is what I'm saying. But the question to me is, uh, and I have no idea if this camera can see me because I'm wobbling <laughs> like crazy. The question to me is, should they ban them? Well, that's the thing, is if you're going to, you got to have some kind of, you know. Program for the yeah, horse well, driving for guys? The for the horse horses and the, and the guys who earn their living that way. We need a just transition, that's what I'm saying. All right, I'm going to go commission or petition Eric Adams ASAP <laughs> to try to come up with a solution for this thing. Because... I don't know, they feel weird to me, but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just being uh, overly sensitive. And I'm not even really an animal rights dude, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm not. You should ask Glenn what he thinks. Oh, we he'll, know what he would oh, think. he'd be like, yeah. ban them, and like, the companies that create them need to be like, launched into the sun and put to death. That's what he would say, because <laughs> no, he, he loves them. animals, what? Yeah, that's true. But he have compassion for, you know, the people who are just trying to earn a living. Yeah, that's true, but I think the animal feeling would override would override the rest. Sit here? Yeah, let's do that. Look at this little fucker. This pigeon's coming right up to me. These pit they have, must get fed all the time by people. Very like this bold. motherfucker's walking right up to us. Look at this one. Jesus. The walk is hilarious though. I like the walk. <laughs> the neck. Do -do 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 <laughs> We're sitting and relaxing in Central Park now. Um, I really do prefer living in the country to live in, in the city. I mean, I lived here for a long time. It took me, because I grew up very much in the country where mm -hmm. I live now. Um, it took me a while to get used to it. Once I did, I really loved it for a while. The city? And then, yeah, and then it was, you know, it's time to go, but... I definitely, I mean, country is my natural habitat, and we both like being outside a lot, so um, that's a lot easier to do, um, and nowheres live, nowheresville where we live, but I do enjoy being here. It feels nostalgic to be back here. I just, I think as somebody who's like really introverted, I just want to get around so many people. Really? I just want to get away. Like, I just want to be like, you guys are too fucking close to me, like, back off a little bit, you know? Yeah, but people don't really, like, you mostly can keep to yourself, you know? Like, you Yeah, but, like, nah, own. when you're walking, like, we were just walking in a crowd of, like, a ridiculous number of people. Yeah. And you just, like, the person in front of you is slowing down, the person behind you is speeding up, somebody's walking, like, directly at you with their path, and you gotta, like, adjust your shit. And I just liked, when I lived here just like the possibility of it and the energy of it and that you could walk out your front door and walk to anything you could possibly want and that you could live here your whole life and never possibly understand or explore all of it that to me was like always my favorite thing was just to literally walk around the city now you don't feel like you can get that from any city you feel like it's specific to new york city yeah. new york i mean in terms of the u.s new york is special there's nowhere like new york so yeah, I think it has its own mystery and its own energy, and I love that it's everybody here. I mean, there every anybody's doing anything, any kind of work, any kind of art, any kind of culture, business, politics. Like, it's just this incredible mixture of people from all over the world, and I yeah, don't think like, there's anywhere why? quite why like are, that. Why here? Because you know, it's not the best in terms of weather. It's in like a weird ass place. Like, why here? Why is here the place? I don't understand why this became the place. Well, I and also, I... Sorry to cut you off. Yeah. I feel like... I like the feeling of other cities more because oh, it's just really? like, like, let's where? tone down... Let's tone down this city, like, 37% from New York City, and then you get the feeling of other cities, you know? What cities do you... What other cities do you like? Jeez. Basically, I, people made fun of me because every time I'd go to a city, I'd be like, this reminds me of New York City, except, like, a little bit less. So, like, when I went to Philadelphia... It was a lot, like, everything was smaller, mm. but it felt like... I actually a, like Philly. A, me too. Well, it was a minier but, New York City. Like, it was a smaller New York City, and I like that smaller vibe. Yeah. And then, you know, L.A. is really not like New York City because everything's so far apart. No, like, you can't walk LA. anywhere. Sorry, um, I, like I mean, I vastly prefer New York to, like, D.C., for example. D.C. to me has no real energy, creativity, spark, 
I mean, it is soulless sort of and vapid, but dead. but yeah. the bright side, there are fewer people there. So you're not going to be walking <laughs> in the street. Nobody's going to be like touching your ball sack. Yeah, and, like, but if you know, you, I mean, if you're going to be in terms of if you're looking for a city experience, personally, in the U.S., I like New York. DC you know what? It's just it's, like, I don't want to be here at all. There's no reason to be here. I just want to be, you know, either somewhere that has that eclectic, exciting mix and every kind of cuisine and every kind of experience or out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, low key, I prefer, I, I like the middle of nowhere more. I think one of the reasons why I'm not so obsessed with New York City is since I was born and raised fucking 15 minutes outside of it my whole life. Yeah. It's like, I just always felt like, yeah, it's there. If I want to go there, I could go there. It's always super busy. There's always so many people there. But it just strikes me as, like, you know, it's that Jay-Z song where he says, like, concrete jungle. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels to me. It's like a concrete jungle. And it just not, doesn't feel, maybe it doesn't feel special to me because I've been so close to it my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I'm a New Yorker. And, yeah. like, when I was a kid, I, me and my dad would go into the city for, like, a Rangers game and watch the Rangers yeah. game or a Knicks game or whatever. And I've been in the city for a million different reasons. Even in high school sometimes, we'd come to the city just to get, like, one of the halal chicken places that was really good the chicken yeah. and rice places <laughs> yeah so like to me it was just always like whatever yeah see <clears throat> it for me i mean i never even went to me first time i went to new york i was a teenager really the first time i spent any time in the city i was in college so it's still even though i lived here for about five years it still has a mystique to it i think most people would agree with you that it has a mystique to it i do I do think most people agree with, but with you listen, on that. I mean, now that I'm, I don't live here anymore and I'm not used to it anymore, the idea of living here is like, I'm, I'm not interested, especially with kids. But, um, so, I mean, I am definitely, my preference is definitely the country, but I do really enjoy and appreciate New York when I get to come here. Yeah. For me, I just, it's just too many people. Like, I just, I'm just overwhelmed, you know? But it is, this is a be beautiful scenery here. Let me show everybody. Nice little spot. We are here at a good time because of the, the um, flowers on the trees. Yeah, and the weather's yeah. nice. Weather's nice. It's, it's like 80 warm. degrees. It's a little warm, but flowers on the trees. Um, Central Park is pretty. I agree with that. But anyway, now we're going to see Marianne Williamson shortly. So that'll be fun. A lot of buildings right there. That's the Empire State Building, right? Yes. There it is. Can't zoom in because I'm driving, but you guys get the Driving along the east side of the city, headed up north to Columbia University. We're trying to get into the Marianne Williamson event, and now we're paying for the nice weather from earlier. It's raining, and it's windy, and it's gross, and my nipples are hard, and my shirt is wet, and yeah. Anyway, when we get in there, I'll try to record some, uh, some of her speech for you guys. Industrial Revolution um, in England and then in the United States, that there were artists and philosophers, uh, both in the United States and in Britain, warning the Western mind, trouble ahead. Trouble ahead. You're becoming so mesmerized by all these machines. You're becoming so mesmerized by all these things on the outside that something on the inside is going to wither away. So when I went in to see this exhibit, there was one, you know, you, you put on little headphones and you have that little machine and you learn more about the artist than you ever knew. I had not known that Edward Lynn Jones was one of those. He's a Scottish painter. He was one of those artists. And this is what he said. Every time they build a machine, I will paint an angel. <laughs> Obviously it didn't work. A lot of machines did get built, some of which did uh, a lot of good, obviously. Uh, no one here would deny that there were uh, some very positive uh, results of the Industrial Revolution with scientific Western scientific materialism, etc. We know that there were some positive things. But we also know that there was an imbalance uh, created. We know that the entire paradigm or mindset of the, night of the 20th century was very mechanistic. And when something is mechanistic like that, if you have a problem with it, you just change, uh, you just tweak a little piece of the machine. 
By the end of the 20th century, it was certainly obvious that while some uh, very positive things had resulted from all of this, um, the imbalance, uh, what this had done to ourselves, what this had done to us as people, uh, was uh, obvious for all to see. The union organizers who supposedly knowing so much had done, and they had not been able to achieve their goal. So Christian Smalls comes back to Staten Island. He knew nothing about union organizing. At that point, the experts in the field called him up, wrote him emails, said, we'll help you. He said, no. Uh -uh. Somebody asked him on a podcast, well, did you know anything about union organizing? He said, well, I think I downloaded the campaign from the internet at some point. What he knew were the workers at Amazon. What he knew were the workers at Amazon. And he got a folding table, and he pitched the tip on a piece of public land that was outside the bus stop the bus stop where the workers at Amazon went every day and left every day, every day and every night, and he was there, and he built community, and he got to know people. He said it was spiritual. He said it was an effort that was built on love and was caring, and they did things for each other, and they heard each other's stories, and they played guitars, and they got stoned together, which I love hearing panels on the other day. The heat they gave up anti-union consultant, and Christian Smalls raised $120,000 on a, uh, on a GoFundMe page. So this didn't just happen. This didn't just go from nowhere. He didn't do it the old way. We are at Columbia University now. There is the one, the only Marianne Williamson. And Crystal and I are about to go have a drink. Don't forget the Gravel guys are here. I will not. We're with the Gravel Institute as well. <laughs> Does everyone want to just take a group shot? I'll take a group shot. That's okay. I'm just taking a video. There he is. The man who made Mike Gravel president. <laughs> This is a beautiful campus though. Yeah. Columbia University. A place that I never could have gotten into with my shitty grades. <laughs> Without a doubt, the best Trump impression I've ever seen. That's, that's true. It, it, it blows mine out of the water. <laughs> I hope I turned that off in time for the non-copyright. No, the radio was just on. Anyway, um, so we're on our way back, guys. Crystal and I had a super duper busy day. Um, so let's walk them through it. They saw it all, but mm -hmm. first thing we did is we went and did breaking points in the city, right? At the same podcast studio that's used by Charlemagne the God and Andrew Schultz for brilliant idiots. Um, give us a light here. There it is. Hello. <laughs> this um, <laughs> interesting. Looks a little horror show-ish. So it does, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks it looks like I'm like made of plastic. It's kind of funny. Like a mannequin. Um so yeah, we did breaking points. Then we did something else, which is personal, which we will not get into. <laughs> then actually that sounded kinda of creepy and dirty, so maybe I should do something. It was else. very wholesome. A very it was wholesome, wholesome it was something wholesome. It wholesome personal thing. Get your mind out of the gutter, you freak. Um <laughs> And then after that, where we go after that? Then we saw Chris. We saw Chris Smalls. We ate lunch with Chris Smalls. Um, that was very cool. Um, we actually ended up eating at the restaurant that is in on the ground floor of Thirty Rock, right? Which right. Is, it's which right. Is it's right next to it. Yeah, oh, it's right next close. to Thirty Rock. Where okay. I used to work for a long. Where time. Crystal used to work when she was at Soulless Ass MSNBC. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Before I saw the light. True. Yeah. And then uh, after that, 
we went to watch Marianne Williamson give a speech, which was awesome. It was yeah. at Columbia University. We had a lot of fun. Shout out to everybody uh, in the audience of Marianne's speech who recognized me and Crystal and came up and took pictures. Everybody was really lovely and wonderful and nice and sweet. And um, then we went out for a couple drinks with, it was uh, myself, Crystal, and some of uh, Mary and Williamson's, you know, close friends, internal team, and the Mike, Gravel Institute. Folks. Yeah, and Mike Gravel's daughter. Yeah, Mike Gravel's daughter, daughter and granddaughter was yeah, there, too. Yeah, which is kind of cool. And they're great. They were all Lovely. super into politics yeah. and talking about, um, Mike Gravel's daughter was all in on direct democracy, and that was one of Mike Gravel's big things. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that I've, in, in recent years, I've come to appreciate even more because when you see, like, how the movement against corruption is sort of hitting a brick wall and not getting anywhere, it's like, well, then what are we going to do? Well, you could find a way, a shortcut around the corruption, which is just direct democracy, direct votes on specific issues. And so she's real passionate about that. And we talked about that a little bit. But, yeah, it was a great, great night overall. Great day. Uh, but I don't know about you, Crystal, but I am shot. Definitely I'm be. super tired. Yeah. Um, I the felt city like takes it out of you. It definitely does. And I, and I felt like uh, we were back in college for a lot <laughs> of it because we were on at Columbia University on the campus in a classroom. Right, right. Or in an amphitheater, which is where Miriam was giving her speech. And then uh, when we went out for drinks and we're walking across the campus, I'm like, Jesus. And then after that, Crystal and I went to Shake Shack just to grab... Got some cheese fries and a milkshake. Cheese fries and a milkshake and the that night, we right? shared. Um, and I just felt like we're back in college. But also, low-key, sort of fuck Shake Shack because... The, the milkshake isn't big enough, and the fries were definitely not big enough. <laughs> the fries were like, for one person, barely. And you and I shared them, and it was like, we each had three bites, you know? It was sufficient. It was what I was after. I didn't need a big, a whole lot of stuff. It was, it was sufficient for her tiny little tummy, but for my gigantic, flabby, <laughs> man pot belly, I was like, I need way more than this shit. <laughs> So yeah, but it was it was fun and uh, had a good day. But I'm gonna sleep like a baby tonight, and hopefully you guys enjoy a little uh, little behind the scenes action, giving you a little behind the scenes love, which is rare. Bye y'all. Good night.